Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. Today I have another weekly used gun review video for you guys. I am getting you two this week to make up for the fact I did not get you one last week and I probably will not have one next week with the holidays and everything going on. We're going to be closed about half the week for Christmas. Uh, also guys, I noticed in my year in analytics, about 11 to 12 percent of my viewers are actually subscribed to the channel. So if you do come back and you like these videos, you get some value out of them, please let me know by hitting that subscribe button and hit that bell notification button so you guys are aware when more of these videos are coming out. Now in the weekly used gun review video, I do take about eight used firearms that have come into the store, giving you guys about a three to four minute little review of each to give you guys an idea of some stuff out there on the market. Remember the point of this video is strictly to be entertainment and educational. I'm not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right guys, remembering the format of this video, we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. So starting us off, I have an Ivor Johnson Champion. This is a 16 gauge. Now there is not a whole lot of information on the internet about these. From what I gather, these were manufactured between 1909 and 1978. As far as dating goes, there is a series of prefixes. This one is a single, I'm, I'm sorry, suffix. This is a single letter suffix, serial number 88844D. Um, if there is no suffix or a two letter suffix that will help you date it. Also, if the word champion is at the bottom of all the text, Ivor Johnson uh, Arms Manufacturing uh, place of manufacture and then the word champion. If champion is at the end of that text, it is a post-1925. If the word champion is at the head of all that text, it is a pre-1925. So that is just the sort of basic information on dating these now. Again, uh, these are made in 410, 12, 16, and 28 gauge per my research. I do not know if they were made in any other uh, calibers or gauges. So if you guys maybe had one in a different uh, configuration, please let me know. Now the concept of the single barrel shotgun in and of itself, if you're in the firearms market, is actually something that you're going to stumble across uh, pretty often, especially if you work at or own a gun store or if you go to a lot of gun stores and gun shows, you're gonna see things like this all over the place. These are made by Ira Johnson, H&R, um, let's say New, New England Small Arms, uh, lots of different companies have made uh, uh, single shot uh, break action uh, shotguns There are also sort of like what you see with AR-15 receivers today. Manufacturers would put out different, uh, what I call them sort of like blanks or um, hardware store configurations where they would make the firearm and then different hardware stores or arms menu, or I'm sorry, arms distributors would put their own uh, make and model onto the firearm, similar like what you get with uh, AR-15 receivers that come out of the different forge houses today. Now, again, this one was made by Ivor Johnson. Uh, the Champion model does range in price, typically in excellent condition. They're gonna top out at about 250. In poor condition or fair condition, you're gonna top out at about 100. Uh, this one here is overall okay. It does have some cracks in the stock, but looks to be otherwise functional. It has most of its bluing, probably rated at about 85% or so. So something in this uh, condition, I would rate probably around the 75, uh, 75 to $100 mark. So not very expensive. Um, at the time that these were made, I mean, these, these single shot top break shotguns and all different calibers or gauges were very popular. Really what you would call the working man shotgun, something very inexpensive to keep on the farm. You typically find these in a lot of barns, uh, kept on, a, on a, a tractor or a car or a, a combine where you could, you know, if you see a rabbit or a coyote or something, you could quickly use it to, uh, you know, dispatch any type of a small game permit, you know, anything like that. Um, and because of that, these things are all over the marketplace and were really popular in you know, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Not so popular today, of course, you can still get modern manufacturer top break shotguns, but these really had their place uh, you know, like I said, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So a lot of people remember, you know, grandpa having one of these in the farm or uh, at the cabin or things like that. It was just sort of that tool that was always around, just a good, inexpensive, sturdy, top break shotgun. This is a great example of that. So anyway, gonna start off number one with the Ivor Johnson Champion. All right, up next is a pretty popular one. This is the Bursa Thunder. Now, Bursa is a company based out of Argentina, and these have been manufactured and imported into the country since 1995. Now, part of what makes them so popular is they do follow the same uh, action type and features of the Walther PPK. So you do have a fixed barrel direct blowback operation. 
So, you know, if you did want to get something like a Walther PPK, you might be in about the five, six hundred dollar price point, a little bit higher today. But something like this, about two to three hundred dollars new, which is, you know, where they've been. Prices are elevated right now. And we'll get into more accurate pricing here in a second. But the fit and the, the, the form and the function is virtually identical. So it's kind of a affordable PPK or Makarov or something along those same lines. Now, this is the CC variant and the CC variant Basically what they did is they bobbed the hammer, made it a shorter hammer. They rounded uh, all the edges to make it more uh, conducive for concealed carry. You have little bevels here at the front for your finger. You have low profile sight. So it's to make the package a little bit smaller, a little bit more concealable for concealed carry. Um, this is also a double single action hammer fire pistol, again, just like the Walther PPK. Now these have seen service in the Ecuadorian Air Force, but other than that, they've basically just been a commercial firearm and here in the United States, they have been incredibly popular. And I find in my store, especially with women, women t tend to gravitate towards these because of the, it does have an alloy frame. So the little bit added weight does make it a little bit more controllable. And with that fixed barrel straight blowback system, it does make them very accurate. So jumping back into the pricing on this, now the standard models, you can get them in like a bitone, all black, all silver. They even have the black ones with like the gold accents and everything. But typically under normal circumstances, new, you should be in the three to $350 price point. Right now, of course, they've uh, gone up a little bit. Uh, used, typically, you know, you find them around like 199, maybe in good condition with the box, with, with one mag. You know, they did come with one magazine. You can get them in a seven and an eight round configuration. Uh, some with a peaking extension, some with a flat floor plate like this. Of course, the CC model is gonna have a flat floor plate, just making it a little bit more concealable. Uh, the CC models didn't really add a whole lot in terms of value uh, on the market. Right now used, you know, of course, in good condition with one mag. You're saying them, again, what the what the new prices used to be about three to 350 online. Uh, typically what people are getting for these, but they do make really, really good concealed carry guns and for the price under normal circumstances, a really good backup carry, backpack gun, truck gun, or just a basic home defense gun. And a lot of people do get these as just standalone home defense or concealed carry firearms for their one and only pistol. And there's nothing wrong with them for that purpose. Um, again, they are also really over built in terms of safety. You do have a uh, decocker safety here, which we've already gone over. You have a magazine disconnect. So without the mag and the firearm, it will not function. And you do have a frame lock. They come with the key. You can lock out the frame if you want to, you know, disable the firearm if you're like leaving it at home for a long period of time or you're going on vacation out of the country or something like that. But uh, anyway, really good pistol. We get a lot of these things in. They do not ever really last long. So there is a burst of thunder CC. Okay, up next is another kind of personal favorite of mine. This is, I, I have one of these and I've used as a sort of a secondary carry or a, a sort of a, a lighter concealment, deeper concealment carry from time to time in like warmer climates and stuff like that. Uh, this is the CAR CM9. Uh, mine is the exact same model. Now they make the CW9, the PM9. Of course, your pricing is going to vary a little bit. They do make these in 40 and 45. Now the PM is the top of the line. Those are really expensive. Those are typically going to find at about the six to seven hundred dollar price point. And really, the main difference is between the the PM and the CM, like this, the more economy version, is there's a little bit more machining on the slide. And the biggest difference is they have an exported um, or export for labor, but imported uh, target barrel. So again, for a small concealed carry up close and personal type firearm, you might not find a lot of need or use out of that target barrel. But for something like this, which is otherwise the same, just a light, uh, a little bit uh, lower quality barrel and a little bit less machining on the slide, you can get into something like this brand new for about the three to $350 price point use. You should be about two to 250. Now again, price is being elevated a little bit. You might be in about the three range of one of these used right now. Uh, magazine holds six rounds. They do make extended magazines. I believe up to about eight rounds. I have a couple of those for mine. Um, when you get these, a lot of the sort of complaints that people get is they are super tight tolerances. If you do, and again, this is personal experience, if you do run about 500 rounds through them, they do loosen up. But uh, disassembling them, taking down this cross pin brand new out of the box can be really difficult to do because everything in the firearm is really, really tight. But tight tolerances in a pistol is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, again, you can get them with longer grips. Uh, they do make them again in um, uh, 380, 49, and 45, I believe is the only four calipers that they make them in. And other than that PM series, again, you should be in about the $300 price point. So not a, uh, a lot else to say about these. They are very, very small. My other main concealed carry is a shield. So this is probably, I'd say about 20% smaller than that. So if you want something for deep concealment, uh, something that's really durable, lightweight, and accurate, 
Uh, these are really good options. So this is the CAR CM9 or look for the CW or the PM series. Uh, really, really good deep concealment guns. Okay, up next I have a product from Ruger. This is the Ruger 9E. The story with this basically begins with the SR series released by Bruker in 2007 and unfortunately discontinued in 2019. I say that because I was actually a really big fan of the SR series. They discontinued the SR series in place of the American series, which I really don't think is a better firearm. And we've had the American series pistols in here and they do not sell very well, but we always carry the SR series and they always move very, very well. Now when they started beginning to phase out the SR series, they did, I, they ran like big sales on the, the uh, standard model like SR compacts, SR 40s, things like that. And there was a point in time where you could get them new for about $2.99. So at that time, if you had picked one up, it was a really, really good handgun. I've always really liked them. Very ergonomic, thin profile, good balance, very reliable and very accurate. Now the SR series would come out to replace the P series. We had one of those in last week's video, which were typically a lot heavier, a lot bulkier. And you know, we got into the P95, which was their introduction to the semi-automatic polymer frame. And then they would move in the, in the early 2000s into developing a whole new series built around the polymer frame, which was the SR series. Now, as they were phasing these out in 2009, or 2019, I'm sorry, they did come out with the 9E, which is this. The 9E is basically E for economy. It's an economized version of the SR series. Now the SR series is basically new about $450 to $500, so not that expensive. But in the economy version, they did get the price point down to about the $350 mark. So they did reduce it by about 35, 40% if I'm doing my math right. Uh, what they had done to economize it was you had less fine uh, machining here on the back for your slide serration. So these cuts are a lot wider. Uh, the basic SR series are a lot thinner, so you have just more serrations there. They did change the finish on the slide. The original one had a sort of a ramp style loaded chamber indicator, so when you did chamber around, a little uh, lever would lift up and you could see red on either side showing you that there was a round in the chamber and you could feel it. On this, they just went to a simplified port, which you do need light to be able to see the round uh, through there. Basically, that was really all that they had done to economize it. Uh, finish, less machining on the slide, uh, fewer small parts, things like that, to get that price, knock down that price about, you know, $200 or whatnot. Now, these are also very popular, you know, for about the $350 price point, getting into something like this, which does have the reliability, accuracy, feel, and balance of the standard SR series, but getting it in a lower price point. I think a lot of the debate there was, and they, this was true of the LC9S series too, they had the uh, EC9S, which was an economized version of the LC9S, and they, they then discontinued the LC9S. Um, I believe more people were sort of gravitating towards the less expensive variations without realizing that they really didn't need to put that extra money into finer slide serrations, nicer finishes, things like that. And if people are going to spend the money, they might upgrade to something like a SIG or an HK or something like that anyway. So really for what it is and for the price, really good uh, functional firearms. Again, I've always been a fan of these. Now the... Uh, if we're talking about the 9E series specifically in terms of what you can get them for on the market today, the pricing is a little bit higher. Typically, I guess the rule of thumb that I'm saying on these, you know, 500 or less uh, firearms is you're typically finding them used for what the typical new price is, and the new price is typically about 50 to $100 ahead of that. So uh, right now you're finding these about three to $350. New, you might be in about the $400 price point if you find one on the market. So anyway, uh, same magazine, 17 round capacity. Uh, they did make the SR series in 940 and 45 called the SR9, the SR40, the SR45, and the compact versions, you add a C onto the end of that. For compact SR45C, SR9C, SR40C for the compact versions, which would come with a standard 17 round magazine with the sleeve and then the uh, the, the fitted uh, pinky extension 12 round for the nine millimeter uh, for concealed carry. So also very versatile. I would, I would always, you know, if somebody looking for that single firearm for home or carry, I would always point people towards the SR9C or SR40C or things like the FNX because you did have that full grip size with that extended mag, also your, your compact concealed carry magazine if you wanted to take it with you. So cool pistols, highly, highly recommend these or the SR series if you find one new, so always got to get these in. Okay, up next is a firearm that actually could not have come in at a better time. This is a GSG Firefly. Now, if you guys remember the video from last week, I had a Sig Sauer Mosquito 22 LR pistol, and I had actually talked about this pistol, and then it came in, so I can add it to this video. So the Firefly, 
uh, basically what you have here is the Sig Mosquito. Now the Sig Mosquito was discontinued in 2013 uh, and one of the biggest problems, you know, we talked about this last week, was its reliability. So when GSG would basically get the rights to come out and manufacture a revamped version of the Mosquito, we basically got this and these are way more reliable. Now the interesting thing about this pistol is you could get these things brand new for about $250 to $289. Uh, used, still the pricing isn't really that high. You know, they're around two to 250, uh, can, you know, depending on what they come with. And they are holistically a much better design and a much more reliable pistol than the uh, Sig Mosquito. Uh, I've gotten tons of great reports on these. We, back in the day when we could get firearms, you know, stocked a ton of these and, you know, we'd sell a ton of these people would transfer them in. Really, really good training implements and never had anywhere near the amount of issues that the um, Mosquito had. Now on the used market, the mosquitoes are still sitting at about $350 and these are a, you know, $100 or more or less and they are a better gun. That's kind of what's funny about the allure of a collectible name or something like SIG, you know, a discontinued firearm that people want really for the name more than the functionality. I'm not knocking a SIG mosquito if you have one, it's just if you're not running high quality, uh, high velocity ammunition like a CCI mini mag, they just do not perform as well. Uh, this has been known to fire things more off the shelf type ammunition like Winchester white box and stuff like that. So if you are looking for an inexpensive, you know, two to $250 handgun that has the lines of a SIG 226, all the same functionality as the Mosquito, the decocker, the safety, exactly pretty much the identical firearm luminescent sights. Uh, this is a great pistol, single action only, or single double action, I'm sorry, single double action like the 226 and the Mosquito. So uh, if you do run across one of these, definitely worth taking a look, the GSG Firefly. And again, these came onto the market, I want to say it was uh, about late 2018, early 2019. So uh, going off of memory there and uh, you know when these things started coming in. So really, really cool pistols, GSG Firefly. Okay, up next I have a very popular rifle. This is a Henry Repeating Arms Big Boy in 357. So the Henry Company, as we know it today, Henry Repeating Arms, was actually founded in 1996 by Anthony Imperato and his father Louis, or Louis Imperato, uh, in New York. Now, the company as it exists and was founded in 1996 uh, is not at all associated with the original Henry Repeating Arms, which was founded by Benjamin Tyler Henry with its, with, you know, the famous model, the 1860 that he would go on to meet with Oliver Winchester, create Winchester Repeating Arms, the rest is history, but there is no lineage or no connection between the two companies. Now, in the late 90s, uh, the, the current day Henry Repeating Arms actually secured uh, rights to the usage of the name. So they really used it as a springboard for the name and the brand, but really no lineage uh, relation, no family connection or anything beyond that. Similar to like how Springfield Armory uh, exists today, which a lot of people think is affiliated with the old Springfield Arsenal, which made like the M14s and the M1 Garands. Again, no no relation there, just a usage of the name to kind of get out there in terms of marketing and things like that. Now in 1997, they would come out onto the market with the H001, which many of you people know is one of the most popular uh, 22 lever action rifles on the market. And that was a huge hit when it released and really brought the company into you know, the forefront of arms manufacturing. Now, uh, Henry Repeating Arms has always prided itself on being an American-made company. A lot of you guys remember, and they still, I think they're still playing them today. I haven't had cable in a long time, but back, you know, in the 2000s, I remember on, uh, you know, on cable, uh, commercials would come up all the time, you know, made in America, Henry rifles, you know, this is how you order it, things like that. So the, the Henry was really one of the only arms manufacturers that really had aggressive marketing on cable television and things like that, uh, where those commercials came up all the time. And that's where I personally first heard about them, and again, in the early 2000s. Now in 2003, with the huge success of the H001, the especially lever gun market really wanted a center fire, you know, 44 Magnum 357, 45 Colt variation of the H001. So they came out with this, the Henry Big Boy. When it comes to modernized lever action rifles, these are, I mean, these are basically the winners. This is, these are the ones that everybody typically wants. The Henry Big Boy, they make them in sort of this brass frame, they make them in a steel frame. Uh, configuration. It is a two magazine fed and a side eject lever gun. Now if we're talking about the traditional functions of what we know today as the old western uh, Winchester levers, uh, starting with the original Henry 1860, the 1866, the 1873, 1876, 1886, 1892, 94, 95, uh, those were all 
top eject. And aside from the original Henry 1860, which was tube fed from the front, they were usually, you know, the King's Patent Loading Gate came out with the model 1866. Uh, the, the Henrys really do not conform to the traditional, what we know as the Western top eject uh, patent or a King's patent side loading gate fed uh, lever gun. Okay, so they really do kind of have their own sort of modern uh, modernized feel and appeal to them. Now they did come out with a side gate variation of this rifle a couple years ago, which had been very popular. Uh, anyway, in this configuration, brand new, you're looking at about the $800 to $900 price point used. Six to $700 is pretty standard. So anyway, Henry Big Boy, 357. Okay, up next I have a very popular rifle. This is the Winchester Model 70. Now this would first hit the market in 1936 and is still produced today. And this is a good example of sort of a modern uh, configuration of the Model 70. And I'll get more into what this is in just a moment. Now when it did come out, it was very quickly uh, dubbed, you know, the, the All-American Hunting Rifle or the All-American Rifleman's Rifle or something along those lines. So it gained a lot of prestige and acclaim within the sporting community inside the United States. Now it was loosely designed off of the Mauser Action, which was of course also very popular at the time. Now these have been made in a tremendous amount of different calibers. Now this is the Model 70 Extreme Weather, and this one is chambered in 270 WSM Winchester Short Magnum. Uh, some of the things that they had done with this rifle is they added a Bell and Carlson stock to it, fluted the barrel, um, I'm trying to think what else. Of course you have a nice matte stainless finish on here. A, just a beautiful, lightweight, free-floated barrel. And on here we have a loophole, I think VX, VX3-1. Uh, optic on here, so just a really nice lightweight setup. Some of the more popular and iconic uses of the Winchester Model 70 was its use by the Marine Corps in Vietnam. Uh, it was really an intermediary or a stopgap between the 1903A4 and the M40 series or the Remington 700 line, so it did see, of course, some uh, service in Vietnam. And of course, has been one of the top selling, you know, deer and sporting rifles in the, in the country. Now, in this configuration, this rifle would be uh, brand new, about $1,000 to $1,200 used. You should be able to find it around the $800 price point. Now, they make different levels of the Winchester Model 70, just, you know, basic composite stocks, wood stocks, nicer things like this, which you can get cheaper, you know, the six, dollars $700 price point new. And hunting rifles like this have not really changed their value that much based on what's going on. Uh, currently in the market, it's really the defensive type stuff like home defense shotguns, rifles, and pistols that are going crazy in price. Things like this have really stayed sort of stagnant in terms of their valuation. But if you are considering a deer rifle, hunting rifle, a uh, Winchester Model 70, of course they're not. No, they're no longer made in New Haven, Connecticut. I think they discontinued production there in 2006. Let's see if actually this says where this was made. It's the Winchester Register Trademark of the Olin Corporation. So they're really just trademark guns now. Uh, and of course, a lot of their guns are made by Moroku in Japan as well. So uh, anyway, really, really cool rifle. Uh, if you consider this versus things like, you know, a uh, Remington Model 700, you know, that's probably its biggest competitor. They're just super nice rifles. So yeah, Winchester Model 70. All right, last but not least is a very interesting and iconic pistol. And we have not had too many of these in here, but this is the C96 broom handle Mauser. It gets the name broom handle, of course, because of the shape of the grip it is reminiscent of that of a broom's handle. Of course, go figure. So this would be designed by Peter Paul and Wilhelm Mauser in 1896 and be produced until 1937. Now in Germany, the German manufactured uh, versions would be in the 7.63 by 25 Mauser or 9mm. And the 9mm get the collector term Red 9 because you'll see a giant Red 9 painted on the grip. Okay. Now this would be the first commercially successful self-loading pistol and would first get the attention of the British. Uh, Winston Churchill had popularized this in the Second Boer War, also carried by Lawrence of Arabia. It fried from an internal 10-round magazine loaded by a stripper clip. You pull this open, you push in, chamber your 10 rounds. Uh, of course, it fires in some automatic fashion. Now, this would have an official uh, production, non-licensed production from Astra Company as the Astra 9000 as well as a Chinese variation as well, okay? The German versions were this one and then they had what was called a Bolo, which was a shortened barrel and a shortened drip, uh, grip, more of a compact variation.
Now, this particular one is what is known to collectors as a wartime commercial. It was a German manufacturer, Mauser, produced commercial vari uh, variation of the C96, which is pushed into military service, and it is denoted by seeing the Weimar era military acceptance marks on the firearm. There's some other variational uh, you know, characteristics about it, the safety, the hammer, and also the serial number range puts it in there. Original finish, uh, this I'd probably say, you know, it's actually pretty high uh, rating on the finish, maybe about 85-ish percent. Really nice bore, most of the bores on these are pretty awful, and this is an all-matching uh, uh, example. Now with this comes this wooden holster, which actually also doubles as a stock. This is not serialized to the firearm. Had it been serialized to the firearm, you know, a complete rig would be uh, pretty valuable. And I'll get into pricing in a minute, but this slides back onto a slot on the back of the grip. And there you have a nice little carbine. Uh, interesting concept here is kind of like the original traditional SBR. Now, when it comes to SBR, could you get this, stick this on here as a non-registered NFA SBR? Yes, you can. So this was actually, I think the only pistol, the C96 was actually by name exempted from the NFA as an SBR, so long as you are using an authentic stock. Uh, now, there were Chinese knockoff reproductions of these. You can get them for about $150 to $180. It was determined in, I think, 2014 by the ATF that that cannot be used as a shoulder stock on the pistol. You can only use it as a holster. Uh, the only ones that can actually be fitted to it and used as a stock would be a original era uh, version, which this is. So just keep that in mind if you pick one of these up. Uh, pricing on these is pretty much all over the board, wartime commercials, you know, excellent condition with all matching parts and an all rat matching stock, you know, complete rig. You know, I've seen top off at about three to four thousand dollars, something like this, which is somewhere in a non-matching uh, stock. Actually, this one's already sold and we sold it for eight, uh, 1,850, so, you know, 1850s. To give you an idea of about the two thousand dollar price one is where about something like this would go. So, uh, really, really cool pistols. Do not get a whole lot of these in here. This is, of course, a mouse C96 broom handle Mauser. Uh, just really not much else to say about it. Just a very classic, cool, interesting design. All right, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please remember to hit that like button. And also, again, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.